Thanks so much for joining us on the PBN podcast. Well, what a great pleasure to sit down with you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. So before we dive into all the amazing things you've been doing with your life in recent years, um, we'd love to hear your vegan story because we get so many different people on this podcast, medical experts, nutritionists, celebrities and actors and musicians like yourself. We just want to kind of really look at people's past and understand the stories in which led people to the vegan lifestyle. And a lot of the time, the stories are very similar, but I'd love to hear it from your perspective. How did you discover the vegan and plant-based lifestyle? Was it gradual? Or was it an overnight thing? How did it happen for you? It was very gradual for me. Um, I uh, intuitively was very, you know, I always loved animals as a kid. Um, intuitively, I didn't think it was right to, I had, you know, my moral justifications as a child, you know, I didn't think it was right to eat uh, mammals, right? So I hadn't eaten, uh, you know, uh, uh, cows or pigs or anything of that nature in, in God knows how long. Um, but I, I found some justification for, you know, dairy and for, you know, fish. Um, and, uh, you know, that was really just lack of sort of knowledge, lack of awareness, um, just not, not, not understanding. Um, I, I would say not being fully just cognizant of everything. I sort of allowed the, the industry to sort of make me feel uh, the food industry to make me feel like um, it was okay. Um, and then ultimately, um, it just, uh, I don't know when I had the aha moment, but it, I just, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I have a very good friend who's a vegan, uh, who has been vegan for over a decade. And I remember sort of talking to him and um, feeling silly when I tried to justify um, the fact that I was eating you know, fish and my moral justification for, you know, this, that, and I just remember like arguing and then just feeling really silly. Um, and then I just, it was just, and you know, my, my family has been, um, my mother is, uh, is vegan. Uh, one of my sisters is vegan. The, uh, my other sister is vegetarian. So it's, you know, it was not so difficult for me, um, in terms of the way I was raised either. Mm, amazing. And as you were saying, there wasn't a, a particular aha moment, but were there films or podcasts or books other than your conversation with your friend? What were some of the sort of triggers that you remember along the journey that kind of like, I guess, pushed you along? Yeah, yeah. One of my one, I just remember after watching Cowspiracy, um, that was incredibly impactful. Um, and uh, I also, uh, you know, Instagram has all has its downfalls but i have to say um i am so you know grateful to be following people like uh yourself plant-based news um earthling ed you know for example i still haven't read his new book um you know there's there's so many you know i followed gene bauer uh who's now become a friend of mine um and i'm just friends with now you know a lot of activists and so i learned so much now through social media um, and, uh, and that's the one blessing of social media, I suppose. Mm, it's incredible. I mean, it's such a powerful tool. Obviously it does a lot of good. It can also spread a lot of misinformation, but what it's done is it's allowed us to get inside these facilities, these slaughterhouses, these factory farms, where previously industry had everything very, very hidden. Obviously, you know, uh, over the years I've been really touched and obviously inspired by your advocacy for animal rights being an actor, there's obviously a balance that has to be struck there because obviously being very outspoken about anything to do with social justice can sometimes be at odds with that type of industry. Have you experienced any pushback from your peers or the industry at large about your sort of, you know, outspokenness towards animal rights? Very much so. Um, very much so. And I'm very cognizant of it. Uh, I am very aware. First of all, um, you know, a lot of my friends um, are not vegan. And when I say that I'm vegan, they, they kind of, it, it feels uh, almost like an attack um, in many ways. And so I don't talk about it too much around certain friends of mine who have, I've been friends with for many years, um, but they all follow me on social media. And I know that it rubs them the wrong way and I'm very aware of it. Also, you know, frankly speaking, um, you know, I've gotten calls from, uh, you know, unnamed individuals who will say, hey, you know, um, I want to put you up for this campaign, but they won't work with anyone that, you know, supports PETA, 
you know, for example, you know, it's, if it's a fashion label, um, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, support PETA, you know, they have some issues with PETA. So, you know, I just want to get your stance on that. And, you know, so it's, and I, and I say, look, I do support PETA, you know, what do you want me to say? I support PETA. I'm not going to pretend to be someone I'm not. So I am very aware of it. Um, but you know, the reality is there are so many friends of mine who are climate activists, right? Like climate change activists. And they're like, you know, pushing their agenda, thankfully, and, and, and talking about recycling and talking about, you know, driving electric and, you know, et cetera. Um, and, it's, you know, I'll say to them, hey, did you know that, you know, also if you reduce your meat consumption or eliminate your meat consumption, that's going to have an incredible impact on the envi environment. And it falls on deaf ears. They become very aggressive towards me. And it's just, um, I, I, I don't understand why I should be, I, it's okay for me to to talk about climate change. That's not ridiculed online, but yet, yet it's not okay for me to talk. Why do I have to feel like a pariah? I'm still fighting for something good, right? I'm fighting for, for justice. I'm fighting for a greater good. I'm not pushing uh, some sort of, you know, political agenda. I'm just trying to fight for these animals that have, don't have a voice and also for the devastation that it's creating all around the world. It's very interesting, and I think it's mostly because of the fact that the climate crisis, or what I'm often, often calling now the nature crisis, is that it's an existential crisis. It's going on out there, up in the sky, in the weather. It's kind of nothing to do with me here in my nice little house on my little plate. I want to be able to eat whatever I want and don't come and tell me what I should and shouldn't eat. Uh, and so veganism, obviously, on plant-based lifestyles encroach on people's personal freedoms, right? And so when we as advocates start to talk about it, people feel threatened. Um, you know, there is this sort of cognitive function that goes on in the brain that when a person feels like their core beliefs are being threatened, human beings actually become more narrow-minded. And it's like a biofeedback, you know, neuropinephrine, this neurotransmitter actually increases in the brain when a person feels threatened and they actually go the opposite way. So the more we push, the more people kind of go the other way. And we're, we're, we're hardwired to do this, which is so fascinating. And I always say to people, you know, the best form of advocacy is actually not to push people towards veganism, but to simply show them the way rather than trying to tell them what to do. And obviously a lot of people who go vegan for the first time, they become very passionate, very determined to tell everyone. Um, and then of course, you know, people go in the opposite direction. And they don't really want to listen. You know, that's very useful advice. Um, I'm not so good at that. I'm not so patient and I don't know how to, you know, it's funny. A lot of the people that I really admire um, are very um, sort of, they, they lead with example as opposed to just sort of, uh, verbal uh you know onslaught and i and i i uh i'm not so good at that i mean i try to lead by example but i'm not and my tactic is usually like hey did you know that da -da 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 -da, you know and it never works so it's actually good for me to hear this from a biological like perspective mm. Yeah, I think I think you know people are very good at um, some people are good at remembering facts. I, I love facts and information, and I've learned over the years that the more facts I throw at people, the more they're likely to switch off. And in fact, my parents, who I often talk about on the podcast in the early '60s, I never thought in a million years that my mum and dad would ever go vegan. But in the early '60s, they four years ago they did uh, veganuary, and they've been vegan ever since. My dad, my dad is the last person on earth. It was like, you know, Trump got into power, Brexit happened, my dad went vegan. It was like, <laughs> I felt like I'd slipped into a parallel universe. But that, but that, yeah, but that happened because I was patient and I just sent my dad loads of like great recipes and I kept sending him health information and I kind of stayed away from the very heavy animal rightsy stuff and the sort of, you know, the activist stuff because I knew it would kind of trigger his kind of, behavioral tendencies to go, oh, no, I'm not interested in that, so I'm not going to listen. Uh, but yeah. You know, I've found that the one thing I found is that we can all, I, I, I don't say we can all, but most people can agree that industrialization of a sentient being isn't right. Like, there's a lot of proponents that will say, you know, well, humans are meant to yada, yada. And I could always just say, do you, you know, look at the food system. Look at what's like most people, if they're aware of the food system, which a lot of people aren't because they look, you know, they go to, you know, McDonald's and they see a, a cheeseburger and they don't, they just see a, a nice picture and food. They don't see what the process. And if you really, I really believe that if you, um, 
if people can become more um, cognizant and educated on the, the industrialization of, of these uh, animals, um, I think that's when people can maybe make the connection. I think a lot of people just don't make that connection. Mm, no, absolutely true. Um, on making the connection, though, obviously, you know, going back to, to being vegan, you obviously, as an actor, playing some some well-known roles, um, especially characters, especially characters that are not particularly vegan in the sense that, you know, they like humans, <laughs> though, you know, humans could do with a few apex predators on this planet. So it's a shame vampires don't actually exist. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, all jokes aside, like being in the film industry and the movie industry, like how has it been with being vegan? You know, what has it been like being on set? Do people provide vegan food for you? What happens where there's props and things? You know, do, do you have to request stuff or is it, has it been quite difficult with things like leather and animal products and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, the, I will say most people are really I mean, look, I'm in a privileged position where if I'm on a set, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm in a position where people are trying to help me, right? Because, you know, the actor is considered, you know, a part of a key part of the production, right? So I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, the, so I, I'm in a position where things are pretty easy for me. I mean, I was in Romania shooting a, a miniseries um, and, you know, I, I they went out of their way to make me a vegan lunch every day. And, you know, they were really sweet about it. Um, obviously, uh, I don't have as much control over um, certain aspects. You know, um, uh, for example, there was a dinner scene. Um, and, you know, this is a period piece. And there was literally steak in front of me. And it was in front of everyone that was in the scene. And I was, I hadn't consumed, I haven't consumed you know, steak and God knows over, I mean, who knows how long now over well over a decade. In any case, I was really upset because I knew that this was, you know, this was a life that was taken to be used as a prop. Um, but nobody else really saw it that there was nothing I could do at that point. It was in front of me and we did the scene. Um, it, it, it was actually, I didn't vocalize it, but it was actually a really tough moment for me, honestly. Mm. I've spoken to many people who've, whose careers or work that they do, whether they're chefs or cooks or bakers working in various industries where they have to work with animal products because obviously the industry that they work with hasn't really moved forward enough. Um, I, I, I see in the future, you know, props like steaks and animal products, you know, 3D being 3D printed uh, or using cell-based meats, right? Because, you know, I do think that Personally, I think the future of meat is a plant-based, 3D-printed type meat or a cell-based meat. Um, on those innovations, like, have you had any exposure to them at all in your travels? What are your thoughts and feelings about the future of meat? Because obviously, people want to eat it. We can't stop people eating meat. But you know, would you eat it? Have you tried it? What are your thoughts on it? I am 100% on your side. I think it is um, the future. I think that it's the answer. Uh, I can't quite understand why anyone who is an animal rights advocate would be an uh, would not be a proponent of cell based, uh, you know, or three D whatever, you know, lab grown meat. Um, there's a uh, first of all, I would I would eat it just to support it. Um, I don't really I don't like for example I don't miss the taste of cheese, frankly. Like I just don't. I, I it, once you get away from it. You kind of smell it. I was just in Switzerland, right? And there was like a, a, we went, you know, there was like the smell of fondue everywhere. I, I don't miss it. I just don't. Yeah, it's just, I just, that's literally what I, I just smell like, like, like living being pus. Like, I don't see it as like this, like, oh mm, my God, I miss this. Like, I just don't. Um, and so, but in any case, so it's not like I'm going to go out of my way to buy like, you know, cheese that's, you know, because I don't particularly like it, but. If I did like it, I would 100,000% support it. Um, and I think it's, I personally think that it's our responsibility as plant-based um, uh, advocates or vegan, whatever, to, to help this industry gain momentum. Because um, if we're not doing it, then I don't know who else is. With regards to kind of what we eat, you're obviously a busy man, you probably travel a lot, doing a lot of things, juggling lots of things. How do you maintain 
health because it's very easy to slip into that junk food space especially now there's so much vegan junk food now how do you stay physically fit and healthy and on top of your game uh, in a world that seems to be oversaturated now with vegan cookies and ice cream and pizza and everything which we didn't have 10 years ago no 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 i um first of all it's not easy i mean i i, I it is and it isn't i i look at it from a very simple perspective whenever i start feeling like i'm eating too many processed foods or i feel like i'm not I just go, okay, what can I get from the earth? It's that, it's that simple. Like, what can I get that's literally something I can... So if I'm at the airport and I'm feeling, you know, malnutrition in any way, I'm like, okay, apple, banana, go to this, you know, shop and say, hey, can I get a side of, you know, whatever you want to call it? You know, it's always like, I try my best to, to just eat whatever I can find, whether it's, a, it's nuts, you know, something that if I was on an island... I could forage, you know, I mean, realistically, I probably wouldn't forage anything and I would starve to death. But, you know, if, in that sense, you know, mm. no, no, it's a, such good advice. I, I think a lot of people are battling with it. And actually, the, you know, the meat industry is using this against the vegan kind of movement a lot in the media recently. They've been saying vegan doesn't equal healthy. You know, vegan is dangerous because it's full of preservatives and it's all these different food colorings and, and additives. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, to me, I just remind people that vegan just means animal free. That's it. That's all it means. It's an animal free food. It doesn't mean it's healthy, uh, that we need to focus on the fact that if you are a vegan, and you've decided to choose this lifestyle, that we are choosing foods that are free from the exploitation of animals. However, health is a choice. You know, if you want to eat healthy food, whole food, plant-based, great, do it. You're going to live a long, healthy and vibrant life. But if you want to eat junk food and that's your personal choice and yeah. Look at obesity in America. It's, it's not because we're vegan. <laughs> obesity in America is a byproduct of uh, um, a lot of these meats that cost a dollar ninety nine for, you know, God knows what you're eating. Uh, fast food, saturated fat, process, who knows what. And, and, you know, frankly, a lot of the foods that are processed have all sorts of animal products in them, you know, milk, this, and, you know, all this garbage. I mean, I was just reading, so I, I love my dog. He's like my son. I don't have kids. Right. And I was just reading a statistic. I don't know if this is accurate, but I just read it. One of two dogs die of cancer. You know, what are dogs consuming? They're consuming processed meat. That's what all the worst for. kind of meat as well. The, worst. The, the meat that's scraped off the bottom of the slaughterhouse floor covered in goodness knows what. Exactly. And that to me was, you know, jarring. And I thought, okay, what can I do to, you know, help my dog? I actually invested in a, um, a plant-based dog food company called Wild Earth. Yeah. So, um, and that's what I feed them. But, it, you know, it just broke, broke my heart. I was like, man. It is. And there's, yeah. there's so much suffering that goes on from uh, companion animals, cats and dogs. And they also the amount of, uh, you know, going into talking about the climate crisis, animal foods account for a huge amount of emissions. I think all the dogs and cats in America, if you put all the, uh, the emissions together, it's like the size of a small country um, that the dog and cat food produces. And so getting animals, our pet companion animals switching over, particularly dogs, the jury is still out a bit on whether cats can eat a synthesized uh you know a diet and synthesized uh, nutrients um but a dirt dogs can certainly thrive on a vegan diet i think the oldest dog in the world was vegan is that right yeah the oldest oh, wow. dog in the world the guinness book of records was well, a how vegan old was dog. the dog oh i need to look it up must Hang have been on, quite a small dog vegan dog record phil we're just going to pause for a sec while i look for that um bramble is a vegetarian ve vegan eating dog who lived in the uk and he held the guinness book of record for the oldest dog in the world and he was huh. he was 189 wait what no, no in dog years no dog years <laughs> <laughs> 27 so 189 wow. in human years 27 in and he, he uh, in wasn't a years. small dog huh he was not a small dog. He was a border he, call. He wasn't like a, you know, because, wow, yeah. that's unbelievable. Yeah. And he lived on a diet of vegetables, organic vegetables, lentils and rice. And he exercised a lot. <laughs> wow, that is just incredible. Sorry, my, my mistake. She exercised a lot. She, she was female. Was she, wow. Yeah. 
so yeah it's incredible and i mean this is what's so exciting about the space that we kind of you know we're talking about is you know human beings for most of our evolution and our and our life our, our existence on this planet you know 200,000 years of modern humans we actually have eaten a, a plant predominant diet and there's this narrative that you know primitive humans ate huge amounts of meat and that we've got incisors and you know <laughs> yeah, what's no, canines it's no. absolute nonsense. And, and no. what's exciting and wonderful about the internet is that, you know, for all its negatives, the benefits are that we're able to disseminate this information. And, you know, it's great to see people like yourself, actors like yourself, putting this information out there. Do you feel, though, that like there is more, well, do you ever feel a sense of responsibility personally? And do you mm -hmm. feel like more celebrities who are vegan, such as you, need to be speaking about it more, not just for the climate crisis, but of course, also the abhorrent cruelty that's going on every you know, day. No, I, <clears throat> I do. Um, and I kind of have a kind of simplistic view f about it. Um, uh, you know, I really believe, and I don't mean to like, you know, be, sound condescending, but I do think sure. the next generation is influenced by trends. Um, and I think that um, it, it's cool to be, uh, um, you know, a climate activist, like it's cool to say, you know, I think we have to make it cool to be vegan, you know, mm -hmm. I think, or, or just use it, let's use the word plant-based because people don't like the word vegan for whatever reason, but let's just say it's cool, you know, and so that the next generation, you know, I do think they're, they, that humans have a responsibility to be plant-based at this point. Mm -hmm. I really do. Um, just based on sheer population and, and just facts. Um, and I think it's a responsibility of people who have a certain amount of influence um, and a certain amount of followers, whether it's social media or, or you know, just a, a platform of, of, of any kind, um, I do think that it's important to influence the next generation. And so a lot of times people will say, like, why do you have to shove this information down my throat? And I'm like, I'm doing it because I'm hoping that, you know, the next generation looks at me and says, oh, mm -hmm. I want to do that. You know, that I feel that it's my responsibility. I really do. Isn't it interesting when people say to us, you're shoving your vegan thing down our throats, but yet when we're driving down the freeway, <laughs> every billboard, every magazine cover we open, every radio oh, right. ad, every TV ad is right. meat, 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 right. meat. Right. So if anyone is actually shoving uh, anything down anyone's throat across human society, it's the meat industry, I mean, it's right? It's so crazy. I was living, I lived in Georgia for eight years and I would go down these, the highway and I would see these billboards for Chick-fil-A and they were mm. so tragic to me. It was this the the joke was that they were there were cows that were writing the chick-fil-a billboard saying eat more chicken don't eat us and and, wow. and and like that's the gag like the gag is like oh um don't kill the cows kill the chickens ha 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 the cows are fighting for and i'm just thinking to myself how is this appetizing how is this how does this make me want to buy chick like to me i just saw it's just so insane to me the the disassociation that people and corporations have with sentient beings. And I got to tell you, having a dog really cemented my mm. perspective. I, you know, my dog has a soul. And I know we all feel this way about our pets. And I'm not, and I'm not saying anything special, but for, I'm just going to speak from my perspective. He has a we soul. We all think, our, think of our children Yeah, that way. <laughs> yeah. But, but no, but he has a soul. You know, he's, I see him. He, he's very sensitive he we have a connection we communicate and dogs are uh, pigs are just as intelligent as dogs if yeah. not more yeah. i don't understand how i could be viewed as you know uh, a, a, a a psychopath if i were to eat a dog and yet if i were to eat a pig i'm just a normal guy and if i say hey i don't eat bacon or i don't eat mm. pig i'm looked at as a pariah i just don't mm. i don't understand the logic it yeah. doesn't well, this, work for me. Dr. Melanie Joy, are you familiar with her work? No. Dr. Melanie Joy, you'll absolutely love. She is an incredible woman. Uh, she's from the US and she um, coined the term carnism. Uh, veganism oh, is the counterculture. Yeah, veganism is the oh, counterculture. Oh, yeah, yeah. She wrote love dog, eat pig, wear cows. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, so the, re the answer to your question is carnism. Mm -hmm that we have as children, as we as humans have grown up in this culture where we are taught that eating animals is normal 
um, natural and necessary, right? That it's, I always get the ends wrong. Sorry mm -hmm. if I go, I've got it wrong. <laughs> I need to <laughs> commit that stuff to memory. Normal, natural, ne necessary, normal, needed, necessary. One of those, one of those three. Sure. And the point is, is that as children, we are conditioned to believe that we have to consume animals, that it's mm -hmm. essential to our survival or we'll die. That's how, what I was taught as a child. Mm -hmm. If I knew what I know now as a child, I would never have touched animals or consumed animals in any way, but we are programmed really through social conditioning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and everyone eats meat because everyone else eats meat it is a mm -hmm. cultural norm and condition mm -hmm. in france they eat horses in some parts of china they eat dogs we mm -hmm. wouldn't dream mm -hmm. of doing that no and so never. this this cognitive dissonance that you talked mm -hmm. about like the only difference is our perception you get those mm -hmm. images on social media where you see a pig on this side and a dog on that side and there's a line in the middle and you say to yourself well, what is the difference and for me that was the light bulb mm -hmm. moment what is Actually, the difference between a dog and a cat or a pig and a cow and a chicken nothing Absolutely. My, my, my wife um, actually commissioned a, uh, an, a painter to paint a photo of a, a photo, to paint a, a, a drawing, a picture, a painting, whatever you want to call it. I can't articulate. Of, it's our dog, a half, and then the other half is a cow. And mm. the, it's, obviously there's a difference, but it's, the, it's sort of indiscernible in many ways. Mm. It's just like a slight variation in appearance. Because we always joke that he looks like a baby cow. And that to me is the definition of speciesism, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like you, 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 speciesism is a real thing. And, and yeah. that is something that people are just, people don't even know that word. Um, right. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's as real as any other type of prejudice. It absolutely is. And, and I think that for me, the crux of it is, is that people are not taught to see animals as individuals. Mm -hmm. They don't see animals right. as persons. Animals right. don't, uh, they aren't afforded personhood, right? But what does it mean to be a person, to think, to feel, to dream, to sleep, to decide, to, to be uh, an autonomous being? Animals dream and see the world in all the ways that we do with all the beautiful colors. Some of it much more in much more complex ways than we do mm -hmm. you know cats and dogs dream like we do pigs dream like we do they have lungs and kidneys and hearts and blood and hair and eyes and tongues and everything that we do we are their cousins i mean in fact actually when you look at the dna of the mammals on this planet we all share like so much of the dna in fact we could say that there are cousins <laughs> distant, absolutely. but there absolutely. are cousins absolutely and isn't it insane when you suddenly realize that as a human beings when we awaken from this kind of carnistic mm -hmm. dream or nightmare, mm -hmm. you might call mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it can be a bit alarming. And, and so I want to ask, like, when you first started realizing all this stuff, did you have that sort of angry vegan phase? Um, I'm still in it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, you know, it's not, it's, it's, I don't know about you, but there, it, it, it keeps me up at night. I'm still at that phase where I don't, I, I, to be honest with you, I'm sad. I mean, even just hearing you um, say, you know, they have lungs and they have hearts and they have, and they have hair and they have eyes. I, I'm sad. I'm just, I, I really, I think about all of the, the factories and I think about the lives that these poor, I mean, if you, you don't even want to call them lives, they're just in these like cages suffering and then they're killed, mm. they're tortured and killed. I just, it makes me lose faith in 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 humanity honestly and i know mm. that sounds like really dire and but it's I just appreciate your honesty yeah, yeah. I, I i'm after i'm asked this question often people say to me robbie with all the work that you do and all the videos you see and all the stuff because we get sent a lot of undercover yeah. investigation how do you remain hopeful and positive mm -hmm. um and i just remind people as long as there are good people in this world who love animals and 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 want to build meaningful world, care with animals and to sh and to build a world where we share this planet with all the other earthlings there's always going to be hope and i think we are unfortunately going through a very dark phase in our evolution as a species um again another thing i talk about a lot on this podcast is i personally believe humans should be reclassified as an invasive parasitic species because agree. we are <laughs> well we're the only if, if you kind of look at the earth right from like a like a like a you know let's say we're in outer space and we're looking at earth we're really the only species that is a cancer on the earth and we're destroying it. Um, mm. And, and mm. I, I agree with you. Um, I, I know that sounds so, you know, Dark. it really does, but it's, but really, I mean, we are, um, we're the only species that is kind of going against nature. 
Mm. Um, we but we also have the possibility and the power and the creativity to completely turn things around. 100, things. 100%. And that's what's so frustrating, right? We exactly. have all this potential. The technology, the, 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 all the information, um, we have the free will. Um, we, can do, we can really turn this around just like that, mm. um, which is the part that frustrates me the most, I think. Mm. Some, some of the ways in which we can turn things around is with influence. And over the years, you've engaged with some celebrities about the plant-based diets. You've responded to the likes of like Cardi B. Are you, you know, uh, engaged with the likes of Vice President Kamala Harris? Have mm. any of these people come back to you? Has there been any kind of like back and forth? You know, have you had any sort of high profile celebrities talk to you about being vegan or plant-based? Um, um, I, I have interacted a little bit with Cory Booker's campaign. Um, I know Cory is a vegan and he uh, introduced an act that um, I think is very important. Um, I know him and uh, I believe Elizabeth Warren are really trying to eliminate factory farming, mm -hmm. um, which would be incredible. Um, so I've interacted a little bit with, with, uh, with them. Um, i trying to think here. Um, yeah, Cardi B. That was just, I, I wasn't expecting a response. I just sort of, uh, I saw, I don't know why, I, I don't know. Oh, I think I saw it because I was on Twitter and I saw maybe on plant-based news or something, someone tweeted like Cardi B, you know, and I was like, oh, I'll, I'll respond to her. Um, uh, who, who uh, goodness, I, I'm sure I have. And I honestly just don't. Oh, I mean, the, there's individuals that'll go and name, but there's people that, you know, I've, 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 um, prolific uh, athletes who I have, you know, sort of shown game changers to, for example, and they're like, you mm -hmm. know, they've, they've changed their lifestyle, but I'm not sure they're, they're public about it. So I won't, I won't out sure. them, but um, you know, things like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Come out of the vegan closet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, because I think they don't want, you know, in sure. the event that they don't stick to it, yeah. They don't want to come out and then right. look hypocritical. So that's a really interesting point as well. So one of my questions is about accountability. You know, veganism is a lifestyle. It's a philosophy. It's not a religion, even though some mm -hmm. people like to call us uh, heretics and uh, all these other names. <laughs> right. But it is a philosophy because the point is, is that the reason that we have created, well, create, veganism was created is to draw a moral baseline to say, you know, as a person who's adopting this lifestyle, I will not consume anything from an animal to adhere to this idea that animals shouldn't be exploited mm -hmm. or abused for anything, their skin, their fur, mm -hmm. their feathers, mm -hmm. etc. But there is a narrative out there that pushes this idea of part-time veganism or I'll mm -hmm. be vegan occasionally. Personally, I think that part-time veganism is just vegetarianism or omnivorous mm -hmm. eating, right? Or mm -hmm. flexitarianism or reducitarianism. Mm -hmm. How important do you think it is to try to preserve the meaning so that it doesn't get watered down or co-opted mm -hmm. and then end up losing all its meaning completely? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one because um, I, I also want to, I mean, and, and there's different, I'm sure, philosophies and approaches to this, but I... I also would like to give people the opportunity to uh, reduce, right? Or, or to, 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 to be perhaps, you know, some people are gradual. Some people don't quit smoking immediately. They need to have some, you know, Nicorette or I don't know, whatever. They need to smoke one cigarette a week. And so I want people to start. I don't want people to feel like um, they have to. I, of course, it would be great if everyone could just say, okay, boom, I'm going vegan. There's no need for this. Great. But I also want people to understand that, you know, they can take it slowly, I guess. And I know that sounds like a little bit um, like I'm being, I, I'm not trying to diminish, of course, veganism is veganism, but mm -hmm. I, I also want to welcome people with open arms um, mm -hmm. because we have to. Um, and Absolutely. so, you know, I think it's a tricky, it's a tricky question. Yeah, it really is. I think it's for a lot of people, it isn't easy. Some people adopt the lifestyle just like that and they mm -hmm. pick it up, they watch a film and the next minute they're done, yeah. you know, but not everyone can afford to shop in Whole Foods. Not everyone can afford to buy all mm -hmm. the fancy vegan meat products. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes in some parts of the US, there's what we call, you know, food racism or food, food deserts mm -hmm. where people have a big due to various things like redlining people don't have access to fresh produce. Mm. And so the only thing available to them often is very heavily processed 
um, pre-packaged foods. Absolutely. Um, and it can be very difficult to switch oh, yeah. to a plant-predominant diet. I'm, I'm about to go do a project in, uh, in Louisiana, in, 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 but deep Louisiana, and I've actually shot something there before. And I got to tell you, I had to drive like, you know, 15 miles to, to go to this one store that had fresh some you know i'm not i'm not i'm not saying louisiana is all like i'm just saying it could be any sure. state it could be where i'm from in the middle of you know any any state in america has somewhere where there is this sort of area where it's sort of like you know you processed meat is really the the easiest and most economic um affordable food um and you know i it was tough and i gotta tell you if i didn't have that extra time that extra money and you know, whatever, it would have been a little bit tough for me to get to have a healthy vegan lifestyle. Of course, I could have eaten, you know, potato chips all day. But you know, that's not going to work. There's a fantastic film called They're Trying to Kill Us. Um, and listeners, if you haven't watched it, please do check it out. It's by an amazing vegan advocate called John Lewis. And this film goes into a lot of detail about these issues and about how many parts in the US, and it's particularly bad in the US, where access to fresh, fresh produce often is, is inaccessible, but often by design, they believe, because of the way the, the system is built, the food system is built. Um, people who are sick or p- people who are eating processed foods, and I think a lot of people who watch What the Health, What the Health draw the, drew the parallels between the meat industry, so the, the animal agriculture industries and the pharmaceutical industries, and that many of the people who are at the top of both of these kind of megaliths of organizations and industries, they all know each other and they're all in bed together. And when people who you know are sick and unwell, they're having to rely on huge amounts of medications for their obesity, their type two diabetes, their heart disease, and the mm. list goes on and on. Mm. They're also eating the foods that are causing these illnesses that are essentially maintaining the status quo for wow. multi-billion pound pharmaceutical industries. Now, of course, you know, I don't want to push a narrative that big pharma this and big pharma that. There are a lot of good people in the pharmaceutical industry trying to earn a good living, save lives, and, you know, make sure that many people can live a lot longer, be pain-free. You know, I'm, I'm not certainly against modern medicine. I think there is a place for it. But it's such a powerful industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and so is the animal agriculture industry. Do you ever sometimes look at the monster of factory farming and ever think, uh, if you ever feel a bit hopeless about it, or do you feel like we'll see a day where it'll totally disappear? Um, gosh. I don't know. I mean, the question, unfortunately, it's funny. I, I, I always think technology um, emerges um, from necessity uh, mm. and, or, you know, or, or profit. Um, and I, I, I do think it's not sustainable. Sure. Um, and so it's just a matter of how soon will it be in the next 30 years? Will it be in 100 years? Mm. I, I don't know. In five years? I, I really don't know. Um, I don't feel hopeful that it's going to be in the next decade. Unfortunately, I wish I, I wish it was, um, but I do think eventually it will cease to exist. It's not for any reason other than the fact that it's just simply not sustainable. Whether it's due to a uh, another pandemic, uh, whether it's due to you know, I mean, who who knows? Lab maybe lab grown meat will take over, and the companies will say, "Oh, it's a hell of a lot cheaper, so we're mm-hmm. going to do this now because it's cheaper." Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, it's great to see more of this conversation being pushed in through popular culture. There was a recent film called Don't Look, Don't Look Up uh-huh. um, with Leonardo DiCaprio. Did you, <laughs> did you watch it yet? Yeah, I did. <laughs> what did you think uh, of the portrayal of what could be the climate crisis, could be animal agriculture? It's mm-hmm. kind of a bit like a, a metaphor, really, a sort of, mm-hmm. you know, a, a very clever way of talking about how humanity have a collective denial about the problem, which is, of course, the asteroid. <laughs> what did you think of the way that film told the story? Um, I, I, we, 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 were, we were laughing. Um, I mean, it was, um, it was uh, I, I'm a big Adam McKay, uh, you know, Vice and the big short. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, it was, it's funny because I've seen the, the Don't Look Up being likened to sort of, I mean, I guess it could be ignorance of anything, right? It could be, you know, this in particular is, is the, the 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 climate crisis or who knows what? Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I do. It's it, it's sort of a caricature-y. In a way, it's so over the top, right? The movie, yeah. it's just so absurd. But then you're kind of you know, as you're watching it, you're like, well, 
is it like if there was an asteroid coming truly if there was something coming for the earth do you think there would be a a, a sect of individuals who would start a conspiracy online to say that it's actually not there and come up with a variety of excuses that are somewhat plausible. And uh, because I see that happen uh, uh, all the time. Um, and, uh, and we all do, um, you know, misinformation spread left and right. So um, it was, it was funny, but scary. It was funny, but scary and alarming watching that film. Mm. This is obviously such a pressing issue. Um, it's going to be the, you know, it's going to make COVID-19 look like a walk in the park, mm. frankly. Mm. It's already happening in many parts of the world with, you know, catastrophic changes in the in the weather patterns, mm. rivers, mm -hmm. dr droughts, forest mm -hmm. fires, Australia, you know, the, the <laughs> Brazil. In your opinion, like your experience and, uh, you know, you, you seem like someone who's done a lot of reading and you absorb a lot of information. What do you think? Where do you think the responsibility lies? Should it be all on us as individuals? Or do you feel like governments and, you know, big industry really needs to be pulling their finger out more? Because we're, we are up against the clock. Um, yeah. We've passed all the planetary boundaries. You know, more than 100 years ago, we were warned by mm. scientists here in London in the early, uh, late 1800s that the Industrial Revolution would have seismic d sort of damage to our planet, mm. Mm. but we don't seem to be listening. And it's a hundred years later. Mm. Well, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's disappointing um, when people like, um, you know, Joe Biden, for example, just passed this, you know, um, agriculture, you know, stimulus, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, forgive me. I don't know the exact uh, verbiage, but you know, some, yeah. some sort of a bill. He, I think he gave them a billion dollars to lower Pro the cost. Propping of them up basically. Yeah, essentially propping them up. And that's our tax dollars, my tax dollars, um, and any American's tax dollars. And it's 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 disappointing. I, you know, I I, I voted for Joe Biden. Um, and it would be nice for um a politician to not worry for once about their reelection chances or, you know, what uh, you know, the the polling numbers are gonna say and just do the right thing. Um, it would be really great to have someone step up. <clears throat> a leader step up and say, you know, hey, I, I understand this may not be the public, you know, uh, uh, general public's opinion, um, but but I, I something needs to change here. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. there have not been there has not been any uh, anyone really willing to do that at the top of the ladder, uh, not that I've uh, to my mm -hmm. knowledge. Uh, and I do think, um, unfortunately, um, animal rights activists, plant based, vegan vegans uh we are the minority at this point and mm. um you know we just don't have we have some influence but you know i mean it's even joaquin phoenix you know when he gave that speech at the oscars uh which i thought was so beautiful um you know a lot of people mocked him you know and 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 it was just it's a shame you know it's really a shame um because you you have actors and uh, accepting awards and talking about all sorts of social issues, every type of, you know, movement, and they're applauded. Uh, yet Joaquin Phoenix was sort of looked at as, you know, right. silly, silly Crazy. vegan. <laughs> right. Because the asteroid doesn't exist, right? It's not right. there. It's exactly. not coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So exactly. no matter what, what we say, no matter how much we shout, um, yeah, you know, the people right. out there, they don't believe it's happening. And I think that comes down to it. It goes about the, what I was saying about the existential crisis. And one of my friends, my new friends, Matthew Schreibman, the founder of Aim High Earth, he talks about the nature crisis. And he says that the climate crisis is an existential crisis. It's outside. It's it's over there. There. It doesn't mm. seem to be anything mm. to do with me mm. as an individual. And the reason why for the last hundred years, it's been pretty much unspoken about mm -hmm. is it's been an unspoken thing is because of, you know, the parodies of those kinds of scientists in look up, not media trained, they're mm -hmm. not science communicators, they mm. don't know how to communicate the problem. And so for more than a century, the problem hasn't been effectively communicated to the public and industry has been so powerful at being able to disrupt the conventional narrative in their favor so that the narrative around money and wealth towards, you know, oil and gas and fracking and all these kind of things has always been in their favor because they've held all the power and all the, sc the screens and all the kind of airwaves really in every way, really for the last hundred years. Sure. And so, 
this sure. has been the problem. And now with social media in the last decade, the, the message, people like Greta Thunberg, the message is finally getting through because young people with their abilities to use technology and to create sure. pervasive, evocative messages are finally getting through to people. But the big question is, is it too late? You know, mm. we, we, there's a great documentary on Netflix called Breaking Boundaries with David Attenborough, and it mm. talks about the planetary boundaries. And he talks in great detail about all these key boundaries that we have gone way past. Mm. Um, we're now in the zone of mitigation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we can't turn the clock back, but we need to mitigate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we obviously talked about a lot in the last 45 minutes. There's a lot of different subjects, which we could probably go down lots of different rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and an hour is not enough with you. And I'd yeah, love to likewise. hopefully do a, an episode two at some point in the future with uh, you. I would but, love that now. Yeah. But, but what is a message? Have you got a message for all your followers and anyone who's watching this who, who may feel a bit hopeless about the future? But like, what keeps you personally positive? How do oh. you stay? How do you get out of bed in the morning and keep operating in this world and doing your job? Are there some things that you personally love to look at or look to, even some simple things that just keep mm -hmm. you going? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first of all, um, people like you, uh, really. Um, you know, it, it, you, so. people that can articulate themselves um, in a way uh, I learn, I'm, I, I'm learning every day. Um, I try to uh, try to be very selective about who I um, listen to and who I'm influenced by. I think um, I think uh, that it keeps me going, um, learning new information every day. Um, and, you know, I mean, look, I. Um, and more and more as I get older <laughs> and I try to, I, I know this just sounds so cliche, but I try to connect to, to nature again. And, you know, I try to, um, I try to sort of connect to whether it's an animal, uh, a bird, uh, you know, I, I really, I really think we need to just slow down a little bit. Um, maybe, you know, take some time to really sit with ourselves. Information is moving so quickly. We're consuming so much where we become so disassociated with, 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 with everything. Um, we just mm. live in these hustle bustle, big cities and it's all survival, survival, and uh, if you have the 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 leisure, uh, if you if you're in a position where you can slow down, um, I think it's important. I try to meditate every day. Um, I do transcendental meditation. It helps me just slow down a little bit. Um, that keeps me going. Um, believe it or not, just doing the opposite, slowing down, taking a beat, um, being kind to myself. I often become so critical of myself. So I think. Um, those are some very, very simple things. Um, and I don't know if some, I, uh, if I some really good articulated advice articulated that. <laughs> no, you did. It's such good advice. You know, we're, we're overloaded with information. Yeah. We're now living in the information age, though. I, sometimes I like to call it the misinformation age. But anyway, yeah. we won't go there. Very much so, but, yeah. but it is a time of, of, of information. And we are personally all overloaded and oversaturated to the point yeah. where it is kind of, you know, causing us you know, mental health problems mm. on a gargantuan scale. And it is important to unplug and meditation and mindfulness are ancient practices mm. that are tried and tested for millennia. And I really encourage anyone who is struggling, as you said, to practice something that takes you away from technology on the daily because it's so yeah. vital. Technology is incredible. It connects us. Mm. We wouldn't be having this amazing conversation without right. it. But it, it is it is our bodies, you know, we are of the earth, you know, but technology mm -hmm. is kind of this other thing that mm -hmm. in many right. ways is not compatible with our biology. No, but not at all. we will evolve uh, along with it. But again, mm -hmm. that's a, a conversation for another time. Mm -hmm. But I, I, before I let you go, I would love to hear a little bit more about your your project Brothers Bond Bourbon. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, with your with your co star. Yeah, is it, yeah. is it Ian? Or do you say Ian, Ian or Ian? Ian, 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 Ian yeah. Soma. Ian uh, Summerholder, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So love to well, hear more about it. It looks like an amazing project, really beautiful photography. You. And um, yeah, tell us more thank about you. it. Yeah, in a nutshell, you know, uh, we did a show called The Vampire Diaries and, and we drank bourbon on the show. Um, we were brothers who were fighting over the same girl that we were both madly in love with. And, uh, and you know, one of the things we were kind of known for is uh, uh, 
um, drinking bourbon. And so Ian and I, you know, we, we like to say we bonded on screen over bourbon and we bonded off screen over bourbon. That was sort of like our ritual. You know, we would, you know, finish shooting, have a bourbon. And it just sort of, you know, we were shooting in the South and we sort of just both fell in love with the spirit. And um, once the show ended and uh, during the pandemic, really, we've been talking about doing it for a decade, but then, you know, the pandemic happened and we sort of said, okay, well, we got nothing better to do. Let's put this thing together. We put this thing together and, um, and voila, here you are brothers bomb bourbon and, um, it's delicious. And, you know, we're, it's been, it's been, an, I've never done anything like it. I've always been in the, what goes into industry. a bourbon though, before, for those that might not know, cause it's a, yeah. it's a strict, it's, yeah. it's a, a bourbon is a, an, it's, an American it's, drink, it, right? A, yeah. Historic a bourbon. Thing. Exactly. It is a bourbon. There's whiskeys, right? But, uh, mm-hmm. and a bourbon is a whiskey, but a bourbon can only be made in America. And a mm-hmm. bourbon is comprised of corn, uh, rye, wheat, and then some people use barley. So sometimes it's a three grain or a four grain and you age it in, uh, oak and oak barrels and uh it's it's a hundred it's vegan um there's no uh, you know animal products and and it's um it's just grains it's fermented grains uh done in a very particular fashion and you take those grains and you create what is called a mash bill um and our bourbon is aged four years um uh, and uh you know there you have it and we have you know different proofs right now we have only one type of bourbon <clears throat> it's an 80 proof and now we have a cast strength coming out that's like 118 proof, which is super uh, strong. But some people like that. We have a rye that we're going to do, which is a, just a higher rye percentage. Um, so, you know, we have different iterations of Brothers Bond. It's been an incredible experience, uh, really a learning experience. I, I didn't know much about this world. Uh, I just consumed the, the bourbon and enjoyed it. Um, so it, it really is a, an art and a craft and how you make it. And, um, you know, I've really learned to sort of appreciate the spirit, uh, very much so. Amazing. Well, we'll put yeah. the links to that in the show notes. So people who do love bourbon can go check yeah, it out. Hopefully it'll be coming we'll, to the UK soon. It, so I'm looking it will be trying it. It'll be coming to the UK this year. So, yeah. Before I let you go, Paul, I always like sure. to ask my guests this one final question. If it, you were stuck on a desert Island and it was just you and a pig, <laughs> Obviously, you don't eat the pig because you're a vegan. And if anyone's heard this podcast, you know what's coming next. If I could give you one vegan dish, one music album, and one book, what would you take with you? Oof. One vegan dish. Um, Gosh. Let me think about this. Um, I know this sounds boring to some, but I just love it. I would say an avocado sushi roll. I just... It's just phenomenal. I just love if it's really good avocado, it's Mm -hmm. I love it. All right. Um, So uh, with a little bit of uh, uh, soy, soy sauce. Um, So I would say that. And then uh, one book, you know, my favorite book, and it's it's sort of a a, a sort of a dark book, but I love it uh, is Catcher in the Rye. I wouldn't say Mm -hmm. it's dark, but you know, that was the book that I sort of when I was a kid, just loved so much. And I reread it and I just love uh, the way he writes J.D. Salinger. So probably Catching the Riot. And then a music album. Uh, you know, I mean, the thing about if you're stuck on an island, right, you're, you're going to be listening to that over and over. And I think new age sort of modern day music can get very old very quickly. So I would go with the classic, you know, and I mean like a real classic, like, you know, stuck with like, you know, Mozart or Beethoven, you know, something that sort of, can consistently play and and I won't get sick of it after God knows how many years. (laughs) And uplift you. Mr. Paul Wesley, thank you so much for joining us on the PBN podcast. An hour absolutely flew by and uh, it was a great pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us, everyone. I've been your host, Robbie Lockie, and this is the PBN podcast. We'll be back next week with more food, fashion, animals, lifestyle, and everything in between. (music) 